Hi, my name's Vivian. I'm from the Figure Group in Australia. You might have gotten the impression from looking at my previous videos that life here is all about sitting under beautiful trees philosophising. Well, while I absolutely recommend that we make the time and the place where possible to do that for the sake of our refreshment and our contemplation, I also recommend that we make sure we're involving ourselves in striving, in challenges, in difficulties. When Billy talks about the importance of these things, he's not talking about an exaggerated form or that we should create difficulties that don't already exist. He's not talking about getting ground down into the ground through just the weight of our difficulties. He's talking about not insulating ourselves against life's natural negatives, not trying to surround ourselves in cotton wool. So I thought I'd show you my orchard today because that's where a lot of the difficulties and challenges occur for me. I've always been attracted to the idea of growing my own food on a bit of land. It's not just about achieving a degree of self-sufficiency and food security. I think for many of us in the industrialised world, in the so-called first world, it's perhaps at an unconscious level, a desire to, to correct the fact that we've drifted away from the creational natural laws. That is to say, the laws that underlie our very existence at all levels, the material and non-material levels. We want to get grounded again. We want to get our hands in the dirt and reconnect with those. Well, I can vouch for the fact that if you do seriously grow your own food, for personal consumption or to sell, it really does provide some very grounding lessons. Anyway, my husband and I bought this bit of land a few years ago with an existing nut orchard and also apples and a few other things. And I thought to myself, well, there's, there's something, perhaps I can make those nuts productive and maybe even get a bit of income out of them. Well, <laughs> they certainly are productive in the sense that every year they produce a lovely crop of nuts without much tending from us. And I just love to see those nuts on the trees. They're just gorgeous. I, I love to see produce on my, on my trees. I suppose this is your classic positive. The yield, the output, the harvest. But along with every positive, there comes a negative. And along with this lovely abundance of nuts, we have this impressive abundance of silver-crested cockatoos. And these are really just nutcrackers with wings. If I don't do something really radical, like run through the orchard on a regular basis for about four months of the year, they'll just decimate the entire crop. And I have to admit, I can feel quite depressed and downhearted when I see all those spoiled nuts under the trees. So here we have a difficulty, a problem, a challenge to try and overcome. As I said, Billy recommends that we don't try and avoid difficulties. And that makes sense because who of us would try to discourage a small child from trying to walk for fear that it would fall over? We know that that falling over experience is really quite strengthening and necessary for its development. <laughs> So here I am again underneath the trees, which are full of parrots. It's very bright outside and I can't get good pictures of the, the walnut orchard. Negatives and positives are just a natural part of our existence. We can regard these totally neutrally, not as a reflection on ourselves and not as something that's created by some god or some devil. We can think of some obvious examples, day and night, heat and cold, light and darkness, male and female. These negatives and positives that exist in our lives as neutral things, these are an example of a creational natural law that everything comprises negatives and positives. Even as we become more wise, the negatives don't go away, they just take on a different form. And of course, the form that negatives and positives take that we create for ourselves through our thoughts and feelings 
and through our actions do reflect on us in the sense that they reflect the way we think and how neutrally we can deal with them also reflects on how much love, knowledge and wisdom we've gained. When we talk about regarding these things neutrally, it doesn't mean that we lose our ability to discern the values of things. It just means that we discern their values in an accurate, truth-based way without prejudice and bias and without belief. We still have to be able to know to take our hand away from a flame if we get too close. We still have to know to get close to a heater or close to a flame if we cold, if we need that warmth. Let's see what Billy says in his book, The Way to Live. Number 472. Even the wisest human being experiences joy and pain, but he or she perceives all manifestations of these, as with all other forms, in their natural and original state, without allowing himself or herself to be uncontrollably overpowered by them. This is in contrast to the usual unwise human being who accepts or rejects everything instinctively, whereby attachment or aversion is characteristic of him or her, which leads to the accumulation of negative thoughts and feelings, as well as to unequalized reactions and to emotions. So when we have a difficulty, we need to be able to regard it as neutrally as possible and come up with a constructive solution. So I've been considering all these things and it really is a lot to think about and the whole concept of how negative and positive, when they come together, create something new, like the light globe analogy that Billy provides, where it's the negative and positive poles coming together that create the light in a light bulb. So I'm trying to think of something constructive to do with my problem rather than just developing a hatred for the parrots or a parrot phobia or just giving up in despair and selling the property. So what did I do? I got a farm dog. Talk about learning from nature. <laughs> this is a farm dog. Good boy. <laughs> He's a Kelpie. He's even got a bit of dingo in him according to genetics. His parents are real farm dogs. They're probably rounding up cattle and sheep as we speak. He loves to round up ducks and chickens, but when I tried to get him to chase the parrots, at first of all, he didn't have a clue what I was on about, and when he finally cottoned on, he just couldn't see the point. Yeah, see. <sighs> so I had to train him from scratch. And I have to admit, the whole process of training him, and I have to, I have to digress here for a minute, uh, has been fascinating because I don't think training a dog consciousness is really all that different from training a human consciousness, only his is so simple and uncomplicated, unlike my rather confused earth human consciousness. At any rate, it requires consistency, persistence, patience, logic, repetition. All these things are necessary to override the existing patterns of thought. What you put in, you get out. If you put contradictory things in, they cancel each other out. If you put negative things of other kinds in, they run aground. And nothing happens to begin with because these processes take a long time. But then eventually, when those new patterns of thought have had a chance to, to get established, you get results. It's been three long years to reach this point because I also had to make sure he wouldn't run away and chase the cows next door. The parrots are afraid of him, and at last we seem to be protecting our crop together. And at the end of it all, we shouldn't just get a, a nice crop of walnuts. We've discovered an unconventional way to protect the orchard that I imagine could be quite useful for others. But this whole difficulty has not only inspired a new solution, it's made me grow. This whole problem of the parrots, which has occupied me enormously, has really made me think long and hard about everything involved, because I never wanted to invest all this time in it. 
I never wanted a dog or to spend hundreds of hours training it. And I've often wondered if it was all worthwhile or if I'm just being an unrealistic dreamer with too greater expectations of myself. But all of that struggle made me think very deeply about the whole truth of the matter. Being uncomfortable made me think specifically about how we tackle food production in our modern world, how we don't share resources, how we seek short-term solutions to things and refuse to consider spending more time and getting less money for the things we need in order to live. And of course I'm talking about those of us in this so-called first world. How we have turned away from working as a community for our common good. Things like parrot deterring would be so much easier were we not all trying to work alone, just for ourselves, and so on. It's not until I have to struggle with such a thing that I am inspired to look so deeply into a matter. And that deep look is what brings significant progress how would it have been, after all, if we had just arrived and simply got a crop without any problems? Sure, we would have had a nut crop, but no deeper development and contemplation. And considering the thoughts is where everything starts, that's the formative power of what's going on. So what else do Billy's teaching texts say about this topic? Again, in The Way to Live, on number 495, Billy says, If the consciousness remains open during all practical and living experience, it can fathom the actual truth which is hidden behind everything. Thus also the pain can become the teaching, if the truth behind the suffering is fathomed. Therefore pain can become the best ally on one's lifelong way on the search for knowledge, love, wisdom and harmony. Therefore, Whatever the human being does, may it be the case that he or she never closes his or her mind to any pain, because it is able to bring a progressive gift, cognition, cognizance, knowledge, practical experience, living experience, wisdom, love, peace and harmony. This is nothing new of course, none of it is, it's just so thoroughly and completely explained in a context that makes sense in Billy's texts. When I was little, I saw pain and suffering as something that was just there to make me feel bad and irritated. It was just an imposition, an interruption, a reflection on me, uh, an indication that I didn't have enough faith in my God. I can imagine that other people, other God believers, would have seen it as a punishment from God. These days, not only do I anticipate the harvest of my nut crop and my other crops, I also anticipate the harvest, the positive harvest, of these fruits that come out of the negatives that I experience. And I try to anticipate these things quite consciously because through doing these things consciously, we can have a ter terrific amount of progress. Without striving, there's no progress. And without difficulty, there's no striving. There's no need to strive. I also like to say that once we've taken the time and the effort and made all the preparations necessary to climb our way out of a deep, deep hole, not only do we get to the top of the hole, but then we're in a position to climb the mountain. We all have personal difficulties to try and deal with. Many a lot more serious than mine here down on the farm. But we also have a monumental global difficulty to deal with. As long as we're being attentive and attending to our personal difficulties in a logical way, at an individual level, then we're in a position to actually tackle the monumental global problems. If we finally turn our ways around, Earth, humankind, and get to the bottom of what's really behind the great degradation of our society and our environment, do this logically, do it thoroughly, do it with consistency and persistence and so on, 
then not only will we be able to achieve stability and stabilize these things and make them all livable again and functional again, we'll be able to achieve a whole lot more because that effort is going to be quite something. And it's going to be very strengthening and make us fit enough to create a world that's so much better than we can imagine, that has a lasting peace, that has measures in place to make sure that we can't go backwards again. These difficulties, these troubles, they deepen our understanding, they widen our perspective, they sharpen our senses if we let them do that for us in a constructive way. Here come my parrots. Sometimes the eagles help me out. <laughs> Saves me a lot of time. Imagine those in my trees. That's basically what it is. Anyway, if you'd like to know more about all of these topics, you can start by visiting our webpage at au.figu.org and follow the links if you like to related pages. There is a lot of information out there now and you just need to go and do your own search and your own research. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you next time.